Alrighty, we are back in our series. We're looking at 15 New Testament words, words of life, words that we use or hear used or um, have used or read in the Scriptures often and often they either over time start to lose their impact, lose their punch or become too familiar with them rather than becoming intimate with them or we use these same words in our regular, like Australian 2023 vernacular, and then import the meaning from our culture into the scripture when we read them. And so we've, what we've been trying to do is unpack these words, just again, just the, the first couple of layers, because we can only do so much, you know, in 25 minutes, half an hour on a Sunday. Um, words like righteousness. What does righteousness mean? What is the gospel? What does it mean to forgive? What doesn't it mean to forgive? Man, that was a great sermon last week, Harold. What does it mean to forgive? And then what does forgiveness not mean? That we sometimes kind of import into, the, into this word forgiveness. Today we're looking at a word that, um, I mean, we talk about a lot at City Light Church and hopefully a lot in any church that, it, that uh, would, uh, would read the scriptures and um, preach from the scriptures, and that is the word cross or the cross. We're going to talk about the cross. Death, perhaps generally, the cross specifically. If you were at the Acts 29 conference, you'd be like, didn't we just do a sermon on this a couple of days ago? Yes, we did. I didn't know that that was going to be there. So if this is revision, then that's great. Uh, my hope is we're going to actually talk about not just what is or what was, or what is the significance of the cross. But also, we're going through this book from Dr. Nijay Gupta, these 15 words of life, helping us to understand how the words are used in Scripture and what are their implications. And so today, we're going to spend a little bit of time on the cross because we talk about it a lot, but we are going to talk about it because we don't want to assume anything. But then we're also going to spend some time talking about the implications of the cross for us today. So that's the goal. First, let me read from 1 Corinthians 15. Very famous and well-worn passage, uh, here at least. Then we'll pray and we'll see what God would have for us today as we look at the cross. Let me read 1 Corinthians 15. Now, I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold to the message I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I pass on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Let's pray. And so, Father God, again, we just need you. We acknowledge our need of you over everything, over all of our lives, over our next breath. And certainly as we come to your scriptures, we need your help. And so please keep us attentive to your Holy Spirit. Keep us in step with your Spirit as you speak to us. Help us to have understanding of these things what you'd have us know, we'd have us understand how you'd have us apply this in our life and live it out. And we pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I did mean to say earlier, yes, it's warm in here. We walked in, turned on the air conditioning, all the power went off, power came back on, but the air conditioning did not come back on. So it's warm. I know. If you were at the Acts 29 conference, the biggest complaint was it was too cold. And so here it's just balancing out. That's what's going on there. Uh, so let's have a look at this, where Paul says, well, if you want to understand what Jesus did on the cross, you want to, you want to understand like the, the foundational aspect of the gospel, not necessarily the entirety and all the implications of the gospel, but the foundation, the core, the crux. And I say that word crux on purpose. He says, I want to make it clear. That's how he starts this chapter. He didn't write chapter 15, but the beginning of this thought. I just want to make something clear to you. Just in case you have a misunderstanding or something is 
obfuscated or veiled or unclear or in any way misunderstood, let me make this clear because it is so important. Brothers and sisters, the gospel I preach to you, let me make it clear. Now, we spent a whole week on the gospel just a few weeks ago. So saying, what is central and foundational to the gospel? Listen in. The good news. The declaration, the headline, that something has happened. Something is different. There's something you need to know. He goes on and says, it is most important. It says, the gospel preaching which you received, which you've taken, your stand, by which you're being saved, if you hold to the message, it is of most importance. And so for, for me at least, this is where I go, okay, he wants to make something clear. There's good news. It is most important. It is central. Everything else hangs on this. Everything else reverberates from around this. This is most important. This is the one thing you need to know. This is the thing. And he says, Christ died. What is the thing? The thing is, Jesus died. What did Jesus accomplish on the cross? What did he actually do? What is the significance of the cross? Paul distills it all down. Again, there is a lot more, and we're going to go into some of the a lot more today. Not, not all of it, but some of it. He says, but what is the central, what is the key is that Jesus died? We sometimes overstate what Jesus did on the cross and understate what he did in the resurrection because we see the, the central significance of the cross. We try to pack a whole heap of stuff in there that perhaps doesn't belong there. Like some people say, well, on the cross, he was somehow infinitely punished or that he suffered an eternity of hell in that moment. Uh, for me, I think that's philosophical gymnastics. He died. That's what he came to do. That is what he did. And he goes on to say he died for our sins. Why? What does that mean, to die for sins? Well, scripture illuminates this for us in many places, Old Testament and New. Let me share a few. Uh, famously, Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. What do you earn when you miss the mark? You earn death. We have all missed the mark. We've all earned death. So what did Jesus come to do? He came to die because death is the penalty for sin. He says, he goes on, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Psalm 45, the Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he'll destroy. Ezekiel 18, man, this is blatant. Behold, all souls are mine. This is what Yahweh is saying. The soul of the father as well, the soul of the son is mine. The soul who, sh who sins shall die. What's the penalty of sin is death. What did Jesus come to do? He came to die for our sin. Hebrews 10 again makes this explicit. By this will, we've been sanctified, made holy, set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Every priest, talking about the old way, every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time which can never take away sins. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. He is now waiting until his enemies have made his footstool for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. So the bulls and the cows and the lambs and the pigeons. If you are going through the, the Bible in a Year program uh, with the church, uh, we finished Leviticus not too long ago. And man, it's amazing, for me at least, listening to all the different kinds of sacrifices. Uh, here's the wave sacrifice. I find that fascinating. <laughs> this is the wave sacrifice. Here's the sacrifice for sin, his sacrificial offering, all these different kinds of sacrifices. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, 
Day after day, the priest stands there offering sacrifices as people come to him and they don't take away sin. But the one man, the one sacrifice, one time for all time, it is effective, efficient, sufficient. He has accomplished what he set out to do by dying on the cross. Absolutely, he suffered on the way there. And we can go into that a bit as well, if we have time. But what did he come to do? He came to die. We saw this last week from Colossians 2. He took our record of wrongs and nailed it to the cross. What was nailed to the cross? He was. Which is why we read, he who knew no sin became sin, nailed it to a cross dealt with it by dying a death that we deserve. He died for our sin. And Paul goes on, he died died for our sin according to the scriptures. And so he's saying this was foretold. This is what we've been waiting for. This is what all of history up to this point has been building up to. All of the sacrificial system, all of the signs, all of the types that we have seen, all of the foreshadowing, all of the prophecy, everything has been building up to this one climactic moment in history, Jesus on the cross, dealing with our rebellion. In particular, in Deuteronomy 21, uh, where the writer says, cursed is he who hangs on a tree. And Jesus became that curse for us took on our sin. And in particular, Isaiah 53 foreshadows this. Let me read it for you. Who has believed what we've heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form of majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was, He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. This is written of Jesus hundreds of years before Jesus. Yet, he himself bore our sickness and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way. And the Lord was punished, sorry, the Lord has punished him for the sins of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man at his death because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Yet Yahweh was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed, he'll prolong his days, and by his hand, Yahweh's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will carry their sins. And finally, verse 12, Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion and he will receive the mighty as spoil because he willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels prophetically showing us what was accomplished by Jesus on the cross a substitutionary death we earned those wages we earned that salary death But Jesus came and took it from us, even as he took our sins from us. And what did he replace? What did he swap? His own righteousness, his own perfection, his own glory. The wages of sin is death, and Jesus died that death on our behalf. He says, this is the good news. Oh, sorry, he was buried, so he really was dead. He was raised. He really came back to life in resurrection power. And Paul says, this is the good news. For this is the good news 
on which you have taken your stand. So it is our foundation. It is our stable platform for all of life. It is the, the rock. The firm foundation is this good news on which you've taken your stand and by which you're being saved if you hold on to the message. He said, this is the most important thing, the cross. It is central. The resurrection is, I mean, we'll talk about this soon. The resurrection is amazing and we don't in any sense want to diminish the resurrection. In fact, I think if you keep reading in 15, the resurrection is the thing that Paul says is the most wonderful. But the resurrection is only wonderful because of the cross. If we are resurrected to live with God forever as his enemies, this is terrible news. But if we are resurrected to live with God forever as his daughters and as his sons, beloved, spotless, pure, with no more stain of sin, no more shame, no record of wrongs because that record has been nailed to the cross. This is the most wonderful news of all time. And so what are some of the implications? And what does it mean when Jesus says, before he goes to the cross, he says, take up your cross and follow me. If we're looking at this word, the cross, and Jesus says, take up your cross, what, what does that even mean? And can you imagine the hearers before Jesus goes to the cross, he says multiple times, on multiple occasions, you must take up your cross. Matthew 10, he says, whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me isn't worthy of me. Anyone who finds his life will lose it. Anyone who loses his life because of me will find it. Imagine Jesus saying this. This is in a time when the Romans, who ruled the known world to these people at least, the Romans, in order to subjugate their people and quell or squash any potential rebellion, would line the streets with hundreds or sometimes thousands of people crucified, hanging on the cross, lining the streets, showing people this is what happens to all who would stand against the power and the might of Rome. Dr. Nijay, who wrote the book we're, we're loosely going through, uh, he said in the time of Jesus, they found graffiti where people would use the cross, kind of like a swear word, like, go, go hang yourself, people might say. Go expletive yourself. They would say, go crucify yourself. It's kind of like the worst thing you could think of, the worst insult you could say to somebody. And Jesus tells his followers, uh, if you don't pick up your cross, you're not worthy of being my follower. What the heck is he talking about? He's saying, and in short, the path to life is through death. The path to life is through death. We spend a lot of energy and effort, not just as an individual, but as a society, removing our death from, from our sight. We take all of our sick people and put them in a, in a room. We take all of our dying people and put them over here. We take all of our older people who are on the way to dying and we put them all over there. We want to look younger because when we get older, that's just us closer to death. We do whatever we can to avoid death and yet what Jesus is saying is actually your life comes through death. The path of life is through death. Firstly, through Jesus' death, and then our own death. Our own death. Not a, not a physical death. We're not just talking about our ticket to heaven. We're talking about the implications for life today. What does it mean to live in the light of the cross today, to pick up a cross today? It's not just talking about our physical death when we go be with Jesus. It's talking about you are with Jesus now. We need to lay down a life. Die to yourself so living in light of the cross, picking up your cross means becoming like our Saviour Jesus who went to the cross. The cross is at the same time the means by which Jesus' perfect, perfect sacrifice was delivered and the punishment we deserve was taken and 
It's the greatest picture of God's love for us. He would not withhold anything, even his dearly beloved son, to show his glory and redeem you for himself. And the cross is an example for us to follow. Laying down our life, laying down our preferences, laying down our security, laying down our prestige, dying naked on a cross on a road for all passers by to see. There's no prestige. Laying down our comfort in order to obey the Father, in order to prefer the needs of another over our own. Some theologians call this cruciformity, living in light of the cross, or being formed by the cross. Gupta calls cruciformity the, pa- the biblical pattern of discipleship demonstrated by Jesus' obedience to God and his love for others, which came to a climax in his willingness to suffer and be crucified. Cruciformity does not diminish what Jesus accomplished on the cross. It just helps us to live out the implications for picking up our cross doesn't take away from his substitutionary sacrifice, doesn't distract from his victory defeating sin and Satan and death, just helps us understand how do we pick up our cross. We follow the example of Jesus. Cruciformity is the how of taking up our cross daily, dying to self and living like Jesus. Gupta gives a few examples of this kind of life in his book. So examples from Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. I just want to pick out three, but there are so many more. We're going to discover some of the more in our discipleship groups this week. How do I pick up my cross daily? What does that look like? It doesn't look like making a new decision every day to follow Jesus. We made one, one decision when God gifted us faith to receive his grace. And every other decision we make is made in light of that one decision. And what cruciformity helps us to understand is what does that look like? It says, firstly, picking up a cross reorients how we engage with our rights. Jesus had all of the rights. This is when he, he goes into the wilderness and Satan's trying to tempt him. And Satan says, you have all of the rights. Clink, grasp to your rights. You can tell this rock to become bread. That's your right. You're the one who breathed and this rock came into existence. Breathe again. You throw yourself off of this high place and command, claim your rights to command the legions of angels to come and save you. What does Jesus do? He does not cling to his rights. He empties himself, becoming sin becoming obedient even to death on a cross. Philippians tells us. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul speaks about his rights to a wage. He says, God says the gospel worker deserves their wage, but Paul says, I am not going to take that right for the sake of the gospel. He says, I'm well within my rights to do this, but in this context, Paul says, it's a better witness of the gospel for me to not take up that right. Gupta says, we embody the theology of the cross when we give up, give over, or suspend a prerogative to support someone else or in order to support somebody else. So when we could do something, oh man, I've had a, I've had a big day and it's Wednesday night, DJ's on tonight. Uh, I am within my rights to say, oh, everybody would understand if I said, it's just been a big day but I'm going to lay down my right so that I can go and encourage others, bear burdens, have my burdens borne, put the gospel on display. I'm well within my right to, I I earned this money, I'm generous with my money. I'm well within my right to not meet this need of my brother or sister or whatever, Uh, but I'm going to lay down my right in order to be shaped by the cross. Just making sense. I'm an introvert. That's my right to kind of stay over here and not greet the, you know, these new people or whatever it is. Insert whatever thing you have there, whatever right you have. Uh, I'm not saying do 
lay down all of your rights and you know, never do anything, but I'm saying uh, it's being shaped by the cross when for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the other, we lay, we, we lay down those rights. Secondly, picking up our cross reorients the social table. And by that I mean like, like a dinner table. Where in Jesus' time, and certainly in Paul's time, when he's writing to the Corinthians, and the Corinthians were a pretty messed up church, but they also had some really cool stuff going on. Uh, they had people who would prefer people like them, prefer people who had more money. I mean, James warns about this as well. He says, don't greet only the person who looks really good or is like you. He says, that's playing favourites and that is not being shaped by the cross. Paul writes to the Corinthians, says, factions, divisions, josh, jostling for position and prominence, not looking after those among you who can afford food, he says, that's not the way of the cross. Rather, when you come together, welcome one another, prefer the needs of the other. Don't greet or welcome only those like you or those that like you or those that can help you. He says, like James says, indeed, if you fulfill the royal law prescribed in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. If, however, you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as sinners. He's saying, don't show favoritism. Don't just... Uh, welcome the rich, those that can help you, those that look good, those who are easy. It says, we've got to love the unlovely because you are unlovely in your sin. But Christ loved you and welcomed you. Living the light of the cross reorients the social table and it reorients our love. It takes things that we once loved and make us not love those things. Things that we once didn't love, now we do love, like Jesus, like his gospel, like his kingdom, like his mission in the world, like his people. Reorients our love. That wedding passage of love in 1 Corinthians 13, it's not in the Bible for weddings. It's, um, you know, it's great to be read at weddings because it's awesome. But it's in there to show us the love of Jesus most starkly demonstrated as he hung on a cross. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 shows us. It says love is patient and kind. Love doesn't envy, it's not boastful, it's not arrogant, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not irritable, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. This is the love Jesus showed on the cross. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This is Jesus on the cross. And it is our example as we pick up our cross, we want to love like Jesus loves. That's what it means to be formed in the likeness of the cross. In fact, Scott McKnight, he says, cruciformity is really about Christoformity. It's not just about the cross. We look to the cross because there we see the foundation on which we take our stand. We see the confidence we have in the love of God. He didn't withhold his own son and he's paid the penalty for us. So we are liberated from our sin from the penalty of our sin, from the power of sin over us and the hope of one day in the resurrection, even from the presence of sin. God has removed all stain, all shame, all guilt from us. So we look to the cross and we remember we are free in Christ. And then we look at the cross and we see our example. This is how we're going to love. We're going to love like Jesus. We want to be like Jesus, dying to self in his death and raising to life in his resurrection. And we too want to go to life and can only do it through dying to self. We share in his death. We share in his resurrection. Paul writes to the Romans, if we don't share in his suffering, we won't share in his glory. And so we run to our own death. We welcome our own death. We put to death our, ourselves. I'm not, I'm not, please don't hear me. I'm talking about our physical death. Again, the gospel is not just an escape pod to heaven. Uh, it is the means by which we pass from death into life. Eternal life doesn't start when you die physically. It starts when you die to self and are raised with Christ. 
Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your love for us, shown so starkly on the cross of Christ. Help us to be fixed on Jesus, enamoured by that moment in history, that moment everything pointed up to and everything has changed since. Help us to be like Jesus in the way that we love, in the way that we view others, in the way that we relate to you. Help us to keep the cross close, that we sit at the foot of the cross, not becoming so familiar that it loses its power, but becoming more intimate with it, knowing that it's through our laying down our life that we have newness of life in Christ. So help us, Lord, in Jesus' name.